Well, I want to say thanks to the, uh, the, the philosophy department, uh, Dr. Fiala, for inviting us here. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And as he mentioned, I'm from the San Joaquin College of Law, as well as, as Jessica, Professor Bobadilla. Um, and you mentioned to, to, to talk a little bit about the San Joaquin College of Law in our, in our clinic. Um, a couple years ago, uh, we wanted to be able to give students kind of a hand-on, hands-on, real-world experience in law. And so the first thing that came to my mind was an immigration law clinic. Um, our school, we have a lot of interest in immigration in the area. There's a lot of interest in immigration. So in the fall of 2011, I asked one student to come with me. And we, we went to the Mexican consulate, some friends we had over there, and we set up an office. And we started to see what types of, uh, of cases would come through the door and if we could actually handle them as with students and actually professors um, correcting their work and, and, and and making sure things uh, were completed correctly. Uh, it turns out we could, and we're, we've grown a lot. I was really surprised by the reaction that we had um, after starting the clinic. Um, so basically, the clinic has a two-fold purpose. Number one is to train more lawyers. Now, I know you're saying, now, Justin, more and lawyers should never go together, right? No more lawyers. But really, in the field of immigration law, we do, in fact, need more lawyers. Um, especially here, let me give you an example. The first day I was at the clinic, sitting there with the students, a man comes in, been a legal permanent resident since, since amnesty, sorry, since legalization, right, since legalization. And he's been working for years and years and years, collecting money to bring his family here from, from Mexico, right? So what did he do? He went to the wrong person. He went to an unlicensed person for help, right? Now this person filed some paperwork for him, filed it incorrectly, okay, let him on for a couple of years and then absconded with the money. So what happens here in the valley, we have a huge number of immigrants, huge number of immigrants, a huge population. At the same time, we don't have enough practitioners to provide what's needed. So what happens? We have um, people stepping up, perhaps unlicensed people, Maybe some of them have good intentions, maybe some of them have not so good intentions, but good intentions or not, right, unlicensed people providing legal services that could end up getting a person into proceedings. Okay. San Francisco, right here, if you're put into proceedings, you have to go to San Francisco to court. I know my, my colleague, Professor Bobadilla, has seen it over and over and over again that there are people put in proceedings here in Fresno that go up to the court in San Francisco and have no representation whatsoever, right? Um, the Department of Homeland Security has recognized that there's a problem. Right? They, they've indicated Fresno is one of seven cities that has an enormous amount or the most, the, the, I guess, the, the most amount of um, immigration service fraud. So we're recognized by the government. It's a really big problem. So that's why we need more lawyers in the area, and that's why we're training more lawyers. Um, at the same time, we want to help our community, especially our under underserved community. And so that's what we're doing. And we're looking forward we're, to immigration reform. And what's going to happen if there's immigration reform? We have a huge population that's going to need services. And what's going to happen if there's no one to provide those services? Unscrupulous people are going to step up and perhaps not do a great job, and I think Professor Bobadilla could talk a little bit about past legalizations and what's happened. Okay. Now, we were invited by the philosophy department to speak about immigration and immigration reform, but since we were invited by the philosophy department, I thought that I would inject a little bit of philosophy, right, instead of just simply going over legal rules. Now, a colleague and mentor of mine, uh, Jeffrey Purvis, who I'm sure some of you have right after this, right after this, this lecture, He's here. There's Jeffrey Purvis right there, right? Well, he's a host of a radio show on KFCF. Happens on, what, first Thursday of every month at 1 o'clock? And sometimes I get to be a co-host. But one of the things that Professor Purvis does, and I'm going to take kind of a, a, a page from his book, is he writes a Dear Professor's Letter, okay? Where he writes a fabricated email that he receives from an imaginary person to be able to discuss certain uh, legal aspects, they ask certain legal questions. Now, I'm sure that he would and I would prefer to have a real email, but through, we have, out of our millions of listeners throughout the world, we haven't really had many emails. So if you'd like to email Professor Purvis and ask a question, there he is right there. You can ask him for his email address. 
Okay, so I'm going to read my own fabricated email, okay, one that I made up to help, present, help me present some material. So this is how it goes. Dear professors, I am an American, born and raised. I have felt really troubled these past years when I hear about our country being invaded by people coming here illegally. Shouldn't we as a nation have the right to regulate who comes into our country? And if someone has come here illegally, shouldn't we force them to leave? Don't we have that right? I've worked hard my whole life. I've never broken the law, except that time I wrote a smiley face on that dollar bill. I think that might be a crime. Could you let me know, Professor? See, everyone hates lawyers until they need one, right? Okay. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be mean, and despite what certain cable news channels wants me to believe, I'm sure that many illegal immigrants are good, hardworking people. But it doesn't make sense to legalize everyone and just forget that they are criminals. They are, in fact, here illegally. I know it's hard for you, professors, with your bleeding hearts and all, to accept people to abide by the, they expect people to abide by the law. But if you want to come to the United States, you need to do it legally. Now I hear that President Obama is giving undocumented children some kind of status and work permit. While the thought of children being able to have a better life here might tug at my heartstrings, it is not the right thing to do because when we reward the children of undocumented immigrants, we're just going to invite more illegal border crossings. Thank you for your time. Signed, Johnny Good, Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, my hometown, Salt Lake City, Utah. Thank you, Mr. Good. Hope you don't mind, but I'm going to use your email right now in a present presentation I'm doing right now. Okay, you've touched on quite a few subjects, right? The first one that I want to speak about is this, this notion that a sovereign nation can exclude people, okay? Where does this come from? In my conversations with people from all walks of life, it's, it's axiomatic. It's just taken for granted that nations have the right to exclude people, right? I'm going to touch on one of the major underpinnings of that power of a nation to regulate its borders, and that's the right of an autonomous nation to self-govern, right? In fact, um, the basic right is encapsulated in the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. Many nations, including the United States and other developed and developing nations, have agreed to abide by its principles. In that declaration, Article 21 says that everyone has the right to partake, to part, take part, excuse me, in government of the country directly or through freely chosen representatives, and also that the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of the government. So, sovereign states are entitled to political self-determination. Freedom of association is an integral part, right, of, of that. So that means you, you're free to choose with whom you associate. What necessarily goes with that is you're free to choose with whom not to associate, right? So they have this right to exclude people, okay? Now, so Mr. Good, in my email, okay, it's evident in many circles that nations have the right to associate with whom they see fit. Should the power be absolute, though, okay? I want to compare this section, this article, with another right embodied in the same document. It's Article 13 and 14 of the same Declaration of Human Rights, which provides that for a right of movement to individuals, whether for economic, personal, professional reasons, as well as to seek asylum and refuge. It says that everybody has a right to leave their country, because everyone has a right to leave a country, including his own, and return to his country. Everyone has the right to seek and enjoy in other countries, asylum from persecution. Now, you, I can see why you would want the right to be able to leave a country, right? You, if you're getting, if, if you're being persecuted, if you want to search for, for a new job, if you like, if you can go someplace and, and better your life, you're going to want to be able to leave. But what happens if you have a right to leave, but other countries have a right to exclude? You kind of have a contradiction there, right? Now, as I recently read in a very good article by Selah Ben Habib in the New York Times, Migrations over borders pit these two principles against each other. So the two principles are foundational to the modern state system. On the one hand, you have the human rights of individuals to move across borders, searching for better lives, fleeing for persecution. On the other, you have the right of states to self-regulate. Okay? Now, in the email, Mr. Good mentioned a recent immigration policy of the United States, which is deferred action. Okay? Let's look at deferred action through the eyes of these, what seem to be competing policies to me. Okay? Now, President Obama announced the Deferred Action Program in, on June 12th of 2012. The Deferred Action Program gives certain undocumented youth, those that meet certain right requirements, including were here before they were 16, are in school, current, have graduated from school, do not have serious criminal offenses, among other things. They can, they can receive to what amounts to a work permit and a, and a protection from deportation. Um, 
Good. When announcing the program, he had the opposite view of what the email said, Mr. Good. It says that Obama thought it was the right thing to do. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that President Obama thought he had the legal ability to do what he did. But that phrase, the right thing to do, to me, kind of calls moral and ethical type decisions, right? So, in his view, the right thing to do, okay, basically, children are born places and they have, it's not their fault if they're born to a rich country or a poor country and they should be able to move, right? Um, it's, and it's deeply antithetical to our principles, okay, to, to take a child that has come to the United States without, um, without any decision on that child's own behalf and then charge them with crime for something that they really couldn't control, right? So there's this idea that the moral thing to do is to do something, they, weren't, they came here not on their own, to let them stay where they were raised, right? A strong restrictionist point of view, however, would say that no, that's not right. The moral thing to do is to follow the law. The moral thing to do is to not reward the children of people that commit crimes that come to the states, come to, our, to, our, to the United States illegally. Well, all that's going to do is cause more people to come. Okay? Now, that brings me to my next point about what exactly is illegal about being here without papers. So, as the email says, Mr. Good called... Um, undocumented immigrants, illegal. So what exactly is illegal about coming here? And I'll turn the time over to you for one. Okay, well thank you. I'm really happy to see all of you out here today. Um, this is my um, work, both in terms of my um, strongest area, um, in terms of experience as a lawyer, and um, primarily what I teach at San Joaquin College of Law. Um, and it's really become um, both my work and my passion so I'm really happy to see so many of you that are interested. Um, just a little plug for our law school, because many of us are here from the law school. If you do want to come and observe any of the classes that Professor Atkinson and I, Professor Purvis teach, please let us know, because we're always looking for bright young people to come and attend the law school, especially my biased opinion, those that want to be immigration lawyers. Bright young people like all of you. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so please come and visit us. Um, so, Professor Atkinson touched on a number of things, and um, one thing I wanted to mention is just again coming back to this area, he mentioned seven cities. Those are seven cities, I think he said this, but in the whole nation, not in California. Fresno's one, the Fresno general area is one of seven areas in the country, not in Cal the state of California, that has the highest rate of immigration fraud. And I've been practicing here since 2004, and I've seen it firsthand. Um, it's really, really a serious and out-of-control problem. But back to the question of criminalization there, um, of an illegal status or undocumented status, there are provisions of the criminal law, the federal criminal law, that penalize different forms of um, somebody being in the United States um, illegally or without the proper documentation, okay? So there's different sections of the United States Code, and those can carry prison terms, especially if the reentry is frequent or ongoing where someone's been caught and maybe punished or slapped on the wrist and then they come back, those penalties kind of enhance. And in my own practice, I've seen people put in jail for sometimes, you know, significant, significant terms, you know, well in excess of a year, at least the actual sentence could be five years when they've um, sometimes just been trying to re-enter to get back to their families. Um, now that gets more complicated if the person was deported because of any criminal conduct. So there's a lot of different variations to this, but it is federal criminal law at some level too. It's not just administrative law. Most of immigration law is contained in different administrative regulations and um, statutes and it's considered to be um, administrative law, but we do criminalize a lot of the conduct, even that which isn't um, purely people that have committed crimes. Often when people are told to leave and they try to come back, often to join their families, they can be put in the same situation that sometimes hardened criminals could and subject to lengthy um, incarceration or other penalties. Um, you know, a lot of the case law of different uh, court, federal courts um, with, in relation to immigration has also kind of analogized deportation itself as a penalty similar to a criminal penalty because you're taking someone 
often uprooting them from somewhere that maybe they've lived for years and you know replacing them in the country that they came from but that itself is a really you know when you think about it is a really harsh uh, transition and can be almost equivalent to um, a, you know kind of a criminal penalty if you consider that people can be separated from their closest family members um, can often suffer health and other consequences as a result um, it's kind of a a strange division in the law though that we consider immigration law in many ways administrative and in fact for those of us that have tried to advocate for immigrants sometimes we're frustrated because especially when people try to start bringing their relatives over you know sometimes there's situations where people say there's no one to take care of my little brother he's you know 12 so I'm gonna bring him to stay with me I'm a resident and when the people like that are detained at the border that are even legal residents that have their green card, um, the situations that they face are very serious. Um, I have um, seen people separated from their young children, told that they, you know, if they asked for a lawyer or if they um, fought at all, you know, signing the documents that the border officials wanted them to sign, that they would be detained for lengthy, lengthy periods. And when we try to challenge these um, admissions in court, in immigration court later, or you know, attack them or suppress them in any way like you might in a criminal proceeding, we're consistently faced with case law that says that this is administrative. This is allowed because it's not really a criminal proceeding. Even though the person's in jail, they're separated from their children, you know, often there's long periods without food and water as there might be in a criminal, you know, what we call more custodial interrogation in criminal law. Yeah. So, I mean, a first entry, right, is what's called a criminal misdemeanor, federal criminal misdemeanor. So that level, I put the, in the email, I put that the Mr. Good had actually defaced potentially a dollar bill. That's the same level as a criminal misdemeanor. So crossing the border the first time, right, and defacing a dollar bill is basically the same level. But when you start adding that on, you start recrossing, they start adding things.